All right, good afternoon. Today's talk is co-sponsored by the History Department and the Black Studies Minor. It is an honor to have Dr. Walter Grayson back for a second lecture, this one specifically focused on the 14th Amendment. Dr. Grayson is DeWitt Wallace Professor and Chair of the Department of History at McAllister College in Minnesota. Dr. Grayson is a graduate of Villanova and Temple Universities. He was named one of today's black history makers by the Philadelphia Daily News. He has written more than 100 academic articles and essays. His work has appeared on Huffington Post, National Public Radio, and in the Atlantic, as, a, as well as in professional and scholarly journals. He is also the author of, editor of, and contributor to 18 books. He is a leader in the field of historic preservation and virtual reality. Dr. Grayson currently writes about the racial wealth gap and the patterns of economic globalization. Would you please welcome Dr. Grayson. Good afternoon. It's great to be here with you all today. Um, having spent most of my early adulthood in Philadelphia, to come back and spend time, especially at LaSalle, with my distinguished colleagues in history and multicultural affairs, but now it's diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as black studies. Uh, this is a truly momentous occasion for me to be back at home with people that are very familiar. I just moved to Minnesota about a year ago. It is different from the East Coast. <laughs> it's a whole different vibe that I'm still figuring out. But uh, today, I'm, I'm very fortunate to share a talk that I first gave in 2004 uh, called The Decline and Fall of American Equality. And at that point, I was, I was pessimistic. But I was just saying I underestimated how things were going to unfold in the intervening 19 to 20 years. Um, that where I saw there were challenges to the idea of equality, um, the wholesale rejection that has emerged from parts of the American body politic, it's more extreme <laughs> than I would have imagined it had been at that point. And so to kind of explain how that has... <laughs> they said something big is going on in here. <laughs> Right, that's right, let us know. So today, when we're talking about equal justice in the 14th Amendment, this is the foundation of trying to explore why the changes are happening today and how important it is that we take a stand to kind of protect the legacy that we all inherit. And so this is just the, the background piece from my website. This is where you can learn about all the kinds of different stuff I do. So it's there mainly as a reference. But today's talk is really designed to kind of walk through the history of the last 150, 160 years through the lens of this particular piece of, of writing, this, this amendment that governs so much of what we know about our world today. To get there, I'm actually very pleased that there's been an online digital coalition of scholars that have opened up the conversation about Reconstruction. And so this is one of these eras of American history that for a variety of reasons has not been sufficiently taught. And we typically kind of glide by it on the way through to other subjects. And in trying to draw more attention to the Reconstruction period, I do have to lay a little bit of context. Bless you. And so, the first is that American historians as a group tend to really focus on two very big topics that kind of dominate our writing, not just within the academy, but also within popular historical writing. This is the Civil War and the Second World War. This, if you go into a bookstore and you're looking at a history section, you'll see dozens of these texts that are constantly coming out every year. They sell the most copies. People realize the popularity of the work. So they continue to kind of find a new angle, a new way of looking at the evidence. 
and sharing that perspective is particularly ironic because the Civil War is what sets the foundation for Reconstruction. And you would think, oh, if you're going to write about the Civil War, you might have a chapter or a section that then follows through kind of the aftermath, but it doesn't happen very often. People don't like to grapple with it. We can get deep into the questions about why it's difficult to grapple with Reconstruction. But I think the more troubling piece to start out is that as African American history, African diaspora history has grown as a field in the last 50 or 60 years. There are two other points of emphasis that have emerged. And most of the resources tended to be about enslavement. In fact, even that word enslavement is a pretty new intervention in that field, is that most of the histories were written about slavery. And so now there's this argument about, okay, how do we talk about that process uniquely in the Western Hemisphere? And without walking through all of it, again, the popularity of the topic, so many people gravitate to talking about how does Virginia decide to base a tobacco economy on the enslavement of Africans? How does that then shape the way the economies emerge in the Carolinas and in Georgia to a significant extent in Maryland and Delaware? Then the second wave of migration that then enslaved people are shipped into Mississippi and Tennessee and Alabama and Louisiana. How does that then change the nature of the idea of the United States. What does it mean to be free in a society defined by a slave economy? That continues to stir up black writers and kind of grapple with the consequences and the legacies. The second area of focus tends to be civil rights history. And so I mentioned a little bit this about this last night, but civil rights history has kind of emerged as the hot popular area for folks to write about in the last 60 years. It's so much more contemporary. The celebration of the Martin Luther King holiday, the kind of embrace of Black History Month, all of this drove a certain kind of writing among black scholars to look at, was this really freedom? What are the continuing barriers and limitations on what it means to be African American in, in the United States and then broadly in the world? So those two topics fixate <laughs> scholars, journalists, any number of creative writers, you're gonna get a ton of slavery, you're gonna get a ton of civil rights, but again, it misses reconstruction. And so this emphasis in the last three or four years to drive and kind of really dig deep into this window from 1865 to 1877 is, is very new, the kind of singular focus on that period. And so I wanna kind of just take by, by a show of hands, um, how many people in the room really have dug deep. I think there's a class here that may have been studying this stuff recently. Reconstruction folks, you read about it a couple times a year, you stay in tune with new literature. Yeah, we got a few folks in the room, all right. So I wanna be prepared you know, for the folks who have the body of evidence to share with us. I'm gonna draw on your skills and your reading a little bit through this talk. But um, I need to set that table because within the study of Reconstruction, the consideration of the 14th Amendment is still uh, pretty unique. Um, we tend to group it with the amendments that come before and after, but it, it has a, just a, a kind of trajectory of how it evolves that is not the same as the 13th and the 15th Amendments. So a few people mentioned to me yesterday that they had been talking about the 13th Amendment. Does anybody have a want to volunteer? How do you understand what the 13th Amendment is? What, what's actually in the language? permanently enshrined slavery that will never be questioned again. It's going to be the enduring, defining feature of the Republic because the Confederacy won. Mm -hmm. wow. Nah, <laughs> completely opposite. Yes? Yes, good stuff, right? So this is the core. The abolition of slavery except as a punishment for incarceration. Up until 1996, nobody included that second clause in talking about what the 13th Amendment does. It was broadly seen as abolishing slavery, period. It really took the crisis of mass incarceration, and especially the work of Angela Davis, to then question, what about this last piece here? 
how does that actually evolve over time to allow for the continuation of enslavement through various other different names and disguises? Douglas Blackman's book, Slavery by Another Name, certainly popularized this, that in fact there were ways that people continued to be exploited. To be very frank, a lot of my older relatives, folks who were my aunts and older cousins in New Jersey, faced those consequences working on farms across that state where they were routinely whipped and beaten and paid no money to go through their work. And this went on until the early 1980s. And so the dimensions of how enslavement evolves, we began to grapple with that only in the mid-1990s and bring it to the table in a different way. Come on in. <laughs> and so we have the adoption of the amendment celebrated in the film Lincoln that it takes place in 1865, enormous compromises and cajoling, almost an accident that it manages to get through Congress and then move through the process of adoption by all the states and again, of the states weren't participating because they had not rejoined the Union at that point. So it was not quite the same bar to overcome. Keep that in mind about how this happens with all the Reconstruction Amendments. How many states are actually participating in the process of making these amendments take effect? The 13th Amendment goes into effect 1865 and for all intents and purposes says you cannot call something slavery and you can't have the institution exist in the same way that it had prior to the conflict. If I was doing this all in the 13th Amendment, we would walk through state by state, town by town, and figure out all the different varieties of ways people adapted to preserve that institution. But today is about the 14th. So before I get to that, I have to cover the one that follows, which is the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment does what? I said this last night, but it was at the talk. But the video's not up yet, man. I didn't get to review and take notes of what I wanted. Yes? Yeah, ha. Weren't at the talk last night, but it's good. You gave us a starting point. <laughs> it's actually about illegal exclusions. Ways that you cannot lose your right to vote based on your ancestry, or your race, or your previous condition of servitude. Three ways you cannot have your right to vote taken away. A big one that wasn't included until 50 years later. Sex. Completely legal. 1870. Based on your biological sex, you can be denied the right to vote. I used to tease my students when I teach this stuff and say, you know, if I don't like your genes, and I'm the county commissioner. Say, no one wearing jeans can vote. Not illegal. The Constitution doesn't protect your wearing jeans to go and vote. There are all these other ways that you can be creative and exclude people from voting. Literacy tests. If you want somebody to vote, and this happens over and over and over again, come here, sit at the table. Can you spell the word cat? Yeah, I got that. CAT, I'm good. I'll head in until I get the point. Don't want you to vote? Uh, we have this Latin text that's come down over the last thousand years. We want you to translate two pages of it in the next 10 minutes. Yeah, we don't want you to vote. I think the my favorite one is someone asked a translation of the Old Testament from the original Aramaic. Using literacy tests to deny people the right to vote and then varying the kind of test that's being offered, completely legal. Poll taxes, your inability to pay, charge someone their entire year's earnings, you can't pay it. Sorry, you can't vote. Grandfather clauses. Look back at your grandfather. Could your grandfather vote? No? Sorry, you can't vote. And incidentally, that means that your grandchildren so it becomes a self-sealing, perpetual guarantee of second-class citizenship. So that's passed in 1870. That piece is what mandates the requirement of the Voting Rights Act when we get to 1965. So you have essentially a century of guaranteed barriers about participating in society. 
despite the power of the amendments to say people can come in and belong and, and participate. Little by little, these are whittled away. Very, very different story for the 14th Amendment. There's a different way that it evolves. And that's the main thing I want to walk you all through in the next few minutes. Let's take a look at the actual language. I'll let that sit. Just take it in for a moment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Pretty clear, right? Straightforward proposition it lays out. It's nothing about different exceptions or codes. It's pretty sweeping. Lots of pieces to unpack in just these five lines. One of the things, and I spoke with colleagues last night about this, is I used to grade advanced placement exams. And in one, I think it was the first year I was doing it, the table leader, the person deciding for the rest of the faculty, decided to give the instructions about how to evaluate this particular question. What is more important, the Moral Land Grant Act? 1862 and its subsequent amendment, 1890, or the Reconstruction Amendments. Which of these two things, we asked all these high school students who studied history for a year, some two, take a position, explain why. And so the table leader sets a standard that I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe the person said it. <laughs> they came forward and said, well, there's no question it's the Moral Land Grant Act. The Moral Land Grant Act is more important than any of these reconstruction amendments. Now, I can see the line of reasoning. It's a very seductive thing. It's essentially, this was the federal government taking seized lands from American Indians, Native Americans, and then converting that to a purpose to essentially create the engineering infrastructure for, for the United States going into the late 19th century. Uh, places like Iowa State, Kansas State, these, these large universities across the Central Plains are all organized under this. And so it's not just the seizure of land, it's not the low-cost redistribution of that land, it's the actual driving of the population out to these areas to find new opportunity so that these territories could become states. Enormously important. You'll never get me to dismiss the land grant acts. Like they invent the kind of infrastructure that makes the 20th century possible for the United States. Not the Reconstruction Amendments. They, they do not line up. And largely because it's the 14th Amendment. Like if you just told me 13 and 15 versus moral, yeah, that's a hard, that's a hard deal. But when you include 14, it's not close. This completely redefines the entire framework of what the United States is and can be going forward. If you're going to talk about Reconstruction, the intervention to end slavery, its prohibition, more or less ineffective, suffrage rights and the continuing fight around it, okay, still debating who and how can vote and what kind of ID you need and who gets access to ballots, can you mail in ballots, all these things continue to be fought. Until very recently, until 2017, we didn't fight over the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was pretty flat. It just says what it says, and that's how we proceed. This is the idea of what the United States will be going forward. And so it comes down to several pieces. The two ones, two that the lawyers really love and focus on, the easy one actually derives from the Fifth Amendment. It's this uh, second full sentence, particularly the second clause. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process, process of law. Okay, 
deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. That comes from the Fifth Amendment. If I were going to do a longer talk on this, I would dive into the relationship between 14 and 5. That sequence is actually an a adaptation of the Declaration of Independence inalienable rights. You have the right to life, you have the right to liberty. Declaration says pursue happiness. You can't legally defend a right to pursue happiness. Can you imagine if we all could just sue each other when one of us made the other one unhappy? There would be nothing but litigation. We would just every day say, you owe me money, I'm angry, it's your fault. But what can we protect? We can protect property. This idea of what you own being wrongly taken from you or damaged. We sue people all the time over that. You broke my television. You stepped on my iPhone. You owe me money for that. It cost me money and time. I want you to reimburse me. That's how Judge Judy's whole life. <laughs> Negotiating property issues that people make claims against each other. Enormously important that that's there. But that's not the piece that actually makes the 14th Amendment different. Those protections were already existing back to 1789. The issue is any state deprive any person. That equation is new. Taking due process and allowing the federal government the explicit authority over states injuring individuals hadn't existed before. This is the entire states' rights argument of the first half of the 19th century, which also is seeing a new 21st century versions emerge. To have the federal government assert its authority saying that a state cannot deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, that's starting to say Pennsylvania can't come and take your house. It's an eminent domain justification. It's also in the Constitution, but you gotta demonstrate that in court. Still due process for you. Mississippi can't come in and just summarily execute you on the street, despite their new segregated zone for law enforcement that they just created. Jackson. I'm jumping ahead. But that one piece of that second sentence asserts federal sovereignty. The federal government is the final word on how states should treat their individual citizens. Prior to that, states decided. And they could assert and did assert that the federal government had no role in interfering with the way that they determined, determined their state citizens' rights. It's federalism. The way that we actually prevent tyranny is by allowing these kinds of balances to play out, that there's limited authority to shape individual freedom. This sentence succinctly ties the entire union together inseparably. What had happened in the Civil War, secession, the election of a president that states said this is a threat to our ability to maintain our sense of our society and our civilization, done. You'll still get people argue for secession here and there, but the 14th Amendment is like wrong. This is a union will hang together. So that is enormously powerful by itself. <laughs> that, before I even get into what else this does, is different than managing slavery and suffrage. To take due process and then give it to the idea of a federal government, have you ever seen a case where there are civil rights violations? You know, George Floyd, Minneapolis. There is a state charge of murder that is then brought against the person who commits the act. But then there are federal civil rights violations that come and follow behind that. It's two layers of governmental intervention, and they coexist. 
But ultimately, the, fed, the federal bears out under the 14th Amendment. If a state is intervening wrongfully with a person's fundamental rights, the federal government has the explicit power to intervene. So that's huge. That by itself, I would, I would say, yeah, okay, that is the reason the war was fought. Due process at the federal level changes everything that existed before. But it's not the game changer. It is not the, the fundamental reason this amendment <laughs> invents all of us being able to sit here and have this conversation. Like I marvel at the constant ways that the 14th Amendment basically made freedom that we don't reflect on very often real. And it's the last clause nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. It's that last little bit. Equal protection of the laws. Routinely in congressional and state legislative proceedings, elected leaders would say, of course the Declaration of Independence is ridiculous. All men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. No, clearly. Some people are smarter than others. Some people are stronger than others. We have different capacities, different abilities, and so we are not, in fact, all equal. This was a propagandistic argument framed at the beginning of an oncoming conflict to recruit people to come and fight. Over and over again, thousands of advocates say equality is impossible. It goes against God. It goes against nature. Nothing is equal. And in fact, there are only two other places prior to the 14th Amendment where the word equal appears. And in both cases, it's only about the equality of the states in relationship to each other. The only really protected category that has equality is that Rhode Island is the same as Virginia. Georgia is the same as Massachusetts. You cannot, as a federal government, favor one state over the other. State equality in a system of limited federal authority is very different from a federal government sanctioning states for denying individuals equal protection. This piece in the 14th Amendment adopted in 1868 was so radical, half of the northern states voted against it. They're like, listen, that's crazy. You're going to really assert that you all can come in and tell us we've got to treat everybody the same? How is that even going to work? Folks are going to come to court over anything that they perceive as like they were done wrong. You'll choke the system. Nothing else will work in the society if we attempt to adopt this. And so if you saw Lincoln and you saw the negotiations over the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment is much worse. The only reason this is part of the Constitution is because it was required for all of the southern states to adopt as they rejoined the country. Say that again. These people were forced at gunpoint. <laughs> you will remain outside of the Union unless you adopt this 14th Amendment. But it changes who we are. All of us take for granted this idea that we enjoy equal protection, that just because someone is mayor or governor of Pennsylvania, they can't be treated better than any one of us in the room. Just because someone has five or 10 or 500 or several billion dollars they can't be treated better than someone who doesn't have massive wealth. That's the principle that's enshrined there. And it allows all of us to aspire, to dream of the things that we can accomplish. The opposite situation, we don't have this clause. You have a world where everyone accepts the social limits that local authorities can impose on them. You're homeless, you're sick, disabled. 
There's no recourse. You're struggling. Anything can be done to you. And they'll say, because of your wretched condition, that's all you can expect. Or the inverse. Everything comes to you. You own multiple multinationals, tons of investments. Your yacht is bigger than most people's houses. You can walk into the process and say, you can do nothing to me. I am immune, sovereign unto myself. There will be no checks on my behavior. I'll buy your jury. I'll buy your judge. You file a complaint with your state senate. I'll buy the people who read the committees. Unequality, inequality is institutional. Very similar to what the Confederacy wanted was the idea that property rights would trump all else. And so when I was studying this area and, and really digging into kind of how the law functions and how the law changes, this ended up leading me back to this notion of property. And so I'll, I'll digress for a moment just to talk about kind of how my career evolved in response to realizing this is that we have these inalienable rights of life, liberty, pursue happiness. I love that Will Smith movie, the celebration he does when he just when he, when he gets the job at the end is spectacular. But we don't have that protection. It's not actually something that's guaranteed to us. Instead, it's about the property that we hold that gets protected. And hopefully that the property will offer us some degree of happiness. A ridiculously painful equation that we never question enough. I studied this for a little bit more than 20 years and then wrote the book The American Economy to basically succinctly teach people about the relationship between life, liberty, and property. And what comes out of the 14th Amendment, providing equal protection, is the idea that property is the primary way that we can actually guarantee quality of life and liberty. Again, protecting property becomes the way that we protect life and liberty. Most of the filings that we get at any level of government governance is about transactions. What are we seeing in the last year? A ton of strikes, people negotiating over pay, hours, work conditions. All kinds of battles over how do those negotiations unfold. Contract law as a body. But it assumes that there's relative equality among the cross claimants, among the plaintiffs and the defendants and people who are trying to negotiate a, a resolution. What I ended up uncovering during the American economy was that a lot of this originates from enslavement. It's the entrenched idea that the best kind of property you should own is another person. So I started tracing case after case, law after law, that uh, the way insurance policies evolve. The ideal thing is to own people because that becomes a form of credit that you can then acquire additional land based on the number of people that you own. Most of the Congress, almost all of the Senate, uses that over and over and over again in the first 30 years of the Republic to build up the way that the, each individual state's economy runs. That piece evolves through industrialization. All of the laws codified around that starts to move into the way that factories grow. That you can't own people anymore. But if you control their housing, control their clothing, control their food, control broadly the living conditions and their access to information. Anybody ever hear of a company town? It's a great way for a group of poor people, lower working class, to essentially be held captive to a larger investor. 
to determine what their daily activities are and what the kind of capacity of their lives will be. What do you get for that? Put up a wonderful monument for this. Big torch. Statue of Liberty, right? Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. Why? We need them to work. We need to grow the productivity in Pittsburgh, in Cleveland, in Detroit, in Chicago. The entire process of industrialization predicated on this notion of still not quite owning people as property, but keeping them in a property-like status where they have fewer options. Contrary to what we're seeing with the 14th Amendment, that everyone is equal. This fight goes to 1886. So the amendment is adopted in 1868. Not quite 20 years later, the Supreme Court is issuing a decision saying that equal protection applies to corporations. If you read enough around this stuff, you'll see that there's a doctrine called corporate personhood. So that if you go and you file for your LLC, it grows, you get a lot of money, expand it out, hire 200 employees. All of a sudden, your corporation is separate from you. It has its own legal standing. I promise you, whatever Pennsylvania corporations, the top thousand in this state, they are more equal than we are in this room. We don't have the capacity to protect our property, our life, and our liberty the way that these co companies do. But that's intentional. The design of the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause get bent to allow for the accumulation of different kinds of property over time. Within a structure where the federal government is dictating what rights everyone has and how states are able to either enforce them or not enforce those rights. Corporations emerge as a central judi judicial entity in the phrase that have the protections of individual citizens but the capacity that they're essentially immortal. They can endure, their boards can turn over. Their ability to accumulate capital is unlimited. I was astonished we don't teach people this in like seventh grade. We're out here teaching people, um, finish high school, go to college, get a job, save up, hope you can retire. It's like, that's not the game at all. Under the 14th Amendment and Equal Protection, the best thing you can do is form a corporation. Aggregate capital as quickly as you can, and then defend it by every tool at your disposal including something like the Citizens United decision, mm -hmm. where speech as money cannot be regulated. Over time, the equal protection piece defines everything we know about ourselves. What we choose to do and how we choose to do it um, are determined by the standing, why we use the, how we use these rules to actually advance our sense of being free. Do this, well, we have about five billion billionaires in the United States, and they have extraordinary power and capacity to kind of dictate who's employed, who isn't employed, what kind of wages, what kind of benefits are distributed. Um, they're essentially the core of corporate, corporate citizenship. We have to confront how do we counterbalance that interest. That is essentially the way it's supposed to work is that the 14th Amendment is, doesn't allow for the abuse of people who have a different sense of life, liberty, and property. But that's a lot more controversial and um, is not defended as vigorously by our courts and by our legislatures. And that leads us to a real problem with the idea of equal justice. Equal justice is really at its base about the idea of our fundamental worth. That as we breathe, as we eat, as we sleep, as we attempt to organize and, and have a good life, 
how do we actually do it? What are the ways that we get rewarded or punished for making different choices? And so in the 19th century, this is much more about kind of um, religion. So you hear about a thing called the gospel of wealth in the late 19th century. Is that if you're prosperous, it's because God chose you to be successful. If you're poor, it's because God wants you to struggle. It's just the faith that you've inherited in God's will. That piece is being negotiated after this, this legal context begins to evolve. And so within that, if you are asserting that generally all people have worth, that no human life is disposable or lesser than someone else's, how do you actually begin to enforce that legally? And you get challenges, you get political movements, that try to assert this. I think most at the front of my mind is the populist movement that essentially is trying to preserve farmers in rural areas and prevent the encroachment of railroads and banks and land speculators across the country. That uh, They appeal back to Thomas Jefferson a lot and say that the United States is designed for the small farmer to thrive. But if you own your own plot, you grow your own crop, you sell it on market, small profit, you can go and try again next year and keep that cycle going. Entirely different from Andrew Carnegie and U.S. Steel or J.P. Morgan and the way the banking infrastructure changes. All of these are much more expansive, if not imperial, strictly. Kinds of attempts to consolidate property. But if we get everybody to aspire to become an industrialist, Maybe you don't have the biggest factor, but you still have a factor. Maybe that's a new kind of equality that we can shape with you. So Henry Ford's really, really good at this. It's like, I want there to be a middle class. I want everybody to be able to afford a car. And so the ability to work enough that you get something fancy better house, better car, better clothes, better food. That's enough, that's equal enough. It's not gonna be perfect, but it's better than just trying to raise crops and sell them at market and get the best price that you can. It's not the end of that evolution. This is where y'all gonna get really angry at me. After World War II, we come up with an even better system. And so instead of a plantation or a farm being the standard form of property that determines the quality of our life for liberty, instead of it being um, the automobile or the suburban house that you can get, um, it's the quality of the food that you can get a hold of, we make the entire structure built around our consumer habits. So to be middle class is to essentially have access to consumer debt. Your property is no longer land, a big building with machines in it. Your property is like, a, what do you call it, your FICO score. You wanna get that up, high 700s. You never know where you're gonna need the money for a medical emergency. You wanna go out, buy a new PlayStation 2, as my 12 year old wants me to do when I get home. That's middle class, everybody has one. Oh, oh, no, I forget. I, I, I'm not middle class because I don't have an iPhone. I'm an Android guy. <laughs> we have these devices, miraculous little machines that give us the sense that we have greater capacity, greater tools, really good property. any number of these little apps that we play with and use in our lives, we trade that for this notion of equal justice. We can't all be Elon Musk. We can't all be Jeff Bezos. But we can use their stuff. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll, we'll, we'll get an income high enough to actually live on for a little while before our heart gives out and before we're disabled. So what does that mean for the way the 14th Amendment 
evolves. It's no longer religious. These are secular expressions of our equality. They're still material. And it presents us with a really troubling question. Is it enough just to make all the money that we can? Is that worth the idea of equality? We don't really get explicit about this. We feel like, oh, what is the argument? My central banker friends are always telling me. Um, yeah, wages haven't really increased in 40 years for most people. But look at what that money now buys. It's not a flat, you couldn't get a flat screen television in 1980. You didn't have access to streaming television with an infinite number of channels and content. Yeah, the money's growing slower, but the things that you like, they're more and they're better. Our life is higher quality now. If you get cancer, it's not as guaranteed to kill you. It's not money that you need, it's these interventions, these tools that you can have access to. That's better than money. And you get to live 60, 70, 80, 90 years. That's, that's the best. You can do that. And it doesn't have to be totally equal. It doesn't have to be everyone having the same access to rights and privileges. This leads us to the problem of equity versus equality. You will never find the word equity in the U.S. Constitution. Equality is a big enough challenge. When I started looking into the idea of equity, it was uh, shareholders talking about, okay, what is the value of my holding in a particular company? What is my average daily return? Um, do I receive a dividend that if I put in a dollar within three months, I'll get at least a dollar twenty-five back, and ideally two dollars or three dollars? That was equity. You own something that generated greater financial worth. She needs a little bit of rest. She's already gotten that. <laughs> that equity equation has become what we substitute equality for. It's that the privileging of property to determine the quality of life and liberty, which was never the intent of the amendment. But that's the trait. We want the chance to say we have enough at all times. And that won't be threatened, that won't be lost, that won't disappear. I remember in uh, spring of 2008, I'm teaching an economic history class. And I'm laying out for the students. The real estate market is hyperinflated. The stock market is wild, off the charts. And I was like, yeah, good time to take out percentage, save, <laughs> protect yourself. Literally, students screamed in my face. No, there's so much money, it's just going to keep growing. So that was like March, October. How did you know? Recession. Literally lucky that anything has survived financially from that period. That's the property we're trading for, is highly fluid and very unreliable. More recently, a bunch of young investors I know <coughs> love cryptocurrency. Love cryptocurrency. Bitcoin's the best. I mine constantly. It's like playing video games, just more money, more money every hour. Tell FTX finds out they've leveraged too hard. <laughs> they lose $2 billion in the space of like a week. Can't return any money to investors. The trade-offs for a consumer system is never equal. And the equity in that is highly fungible. We can never trust the valuation. But we don't discuss that clearly. I watch business news a ton. Mostly it's liars. When I talk to financial advisors who also see business news a lot, they're like, I watch it mainly to laugh. It's kind of comedy. No, they don't understand the way markets actually work. They don't have the expertise. They're just selling people 
on a perception of prosperity. And then manipulating when they should take statements out or when they should put more in. It's, it's kind of a shell game. You have people moving the goalposts on your, in front of your face with advertising so their salaries stay high. Not equality in pursuit of an equity that doesn't exist. But for folks who work in education, a very different sense of what equity is. I don't know if folks have uh, seen the infographics. That's uh, someone standing at a fence to watch a baseball game. Equality is everybody standing on the same box to look over the fence. But one person's tall, one person's short. The outcome of whether you can actually see the game is different. And so they argue that equity is actually adjusting the boxes to the person's tall, you don't need a box. If you're short, you get two boxes. So you can see the game. The argument is justice is actually taking the fence down. Let it so everybody can see. Why is there a barrier? That equity will never exist in the financial markets. It is entirely philosophically opposed to this notion that everybody can put in and receive some kind of benefit from what they've contributed. It's winners and losers and who can extract the most. It's very much what the Confederacy wanted prior to the Civil War. There could be one winner, or two, but certainly not 10 or 20 or 30. We'd like, well actually you're coming to the place where we don't even like that there's 5,000 billionaires. Right now we're going through a contraction where the billionaires are chewing each other up, trying to make it so that there's only 2,000 billionaires by the end of 2024. A lot of the inflation stuff is about this. It's about uh, Uber being highly leveraged or Lyft, and can you crush their company and sell their assets at pennies on the dollar? Uh, Netflix is going through the same thing. How do you destroy the people through competition to reset the way the entire structure works and so that changing nature of property, the way that our finance and our philosophy are at odds around concepts like equity, this all derives from our resistance to embrace the 14th Amendment. And so my closing point for all of you is about the opportunities and outcomes that we have right now. And so this debate often comes down to the use of equality or individual rights and how controversial it is. I need to go back and show you one other thing. controversy around the 14th Amendment has now moved away from the well-established, legally entrenched legal understandings of the amendment and how it can be used to this first phrase, all persons born or naturalized in the United States. The challenge right now is to try and redefine the 14th Amendment to say that naturalized doesn't belong there. And really, it shouldn't even be all people born. There has to be a higher standard for what gets you to be an American citizen. And so how can you actually change the citizenship requirement? The primary recommendation is a property requirement. If you don't own a home or a business, you may not participate as a citizen in the United States. Dramatically limits the voting pool, completely reorients the way we understand the function of the society. But that's the argument, is that we need some new restriction that takes this away from a group of people who haven't earned the responsibility to be leaders and to have a voice. And so, despite the power of all the freedoms that flow from this, the way that we've grown the economy, the way that we have had liberal democracy sweep the planet and redefine the way constitutional systems work, the challenge now is, shouldn't we just restrict this to 10% of the population that can actually participate? And the core of the problem comes down to a debate between, really a false debate. Do we want to provide equality of opportunity or equality of outcomes? And again, you're going to hear the phrase over and over and over again. We can give you equality of opportunity. You'll have a chance to do the best you can to the best of your ability, to compete. But 
but we can never guarantee equality of outcomes, that everybody will have. A friend of mine just proposed new legislation in Congress yesterday. It's called uh, baby bonds. Baby bonds guarantee that uh, $25,000 is held in an account for you over your first 18 years, and that when you graduate high school, when you turn 18, uh, you get that money to either go on and get higher education or to start a business. It's essentially designed to abolish the student loan system. And so people are like, no, that's an equality of outcome. You're guaranteeing a result for people that they haven't earned. We could never do anything like that. Similar proposal for uh, minimum basic income, really pop and popular in Europe. I think even Alaska has a similar thing they call a state dividend. And so minimum basic income is essentially saying you don't need welfare to work. There's a minimum kind of human standard of dignity that we're going to underwrite as a society so that right now poverty level is a 22,000. We're going to guarantee that everybody in the United States gets half that, ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 a year to make sure you're not able to negotiate this, this industrial capital system. Quality of outcome, can't do it. it. Takes away the incentive to struggle and scrap and make good decisions and be fiscally responsible. My proposition to you all as we close today is that these two things are a false binary. You can't have equality of opportunity without some degree of equality of outcome. There has to be a floor that then allows for the way people can to do their best in the society. You don't have to choose one thing or the other. You find a way that they fuel each other and create balance and extend opportunity for people so that everyone can reach their best outcome. And all of us can't. We're going to find a spot. I wish I was still 25 and my left leg was not so broken up that my hip and my knee and my ankle are pretty much shattered. I can't run up and down stairs the same way I used to. I'm going to need help at some point. It might be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. I'm going to need help. I hope someone does come up and say, like, your left leg's useless. Sorry. <laughs> Done with this. Don't need to be here anymore. You're not productive. How do we actually manage our actual human needs? And not just in the United States, but around the world. The real challenge with this is with the competition between China and India fighting over control of Southeast Asia. That's where most of the human population lives. And how do we structure what is good opportunity, freedom, equality, equity in these regions outside of the US? How do I do it? This is where I'll wrap up and take questions. The work that I do around these questions is, I'm very happy to say, gaining popularity. About 10 years ago, I started using the research in American economy to draft infographics. And these essentially track the way the economy changes around the world over the last 200 years. And so within the US, I look at particular states and the way that slavery operated as an economy. We tend to lump together all of those states and say they all work the same. They're completely different. They all have wild variations one to the other. I go across the Midwest and look about the different ways that these states industrialized in the first half of the 20th century and look at all the variations in the ways they perform differently. I even have one for service economies and consumerism that looks at the big markets that exist around the world. How does the European Union function? How is it changing? But doing this work and rendering it graphically so that people can access the data more readily and kind of understand the different strengths by sector, teaches everyone how to invest more effectively. How do they actually make good decisions? The best single outcome is for folks who are in high school, even in middle school, let alone college, to understand, okay, I know where jobs are gonna grow in the next 18 months. I know if I get that expertise and show that I can be productive, I can then go and get a small business loan to open up in a place that needs to start to grow. One of my favorite stories with this was going out to John, uh, Johnstown in uh, Western PA, collapsed steel town, and just worked with them for a year. 
And all of a sudden they have foreign investment flowing in from Japan, from Korea, basically because the steel industries had moved abroad and they needed to know what the people in Johnstown knew in order to actually make an efficient steel market develop in the Pacific Rim. We don't do enough of communicating about the idea of life, liberty, property, the way equal opportunity works, the way that equality functions in our society and in our marketplaces. But doing infographics now, I've, I'm just astonished at the success. The one main website is called Visual Capitalist, and they produce new infographics every single hour that help show the way that the world is changing around us without having to sit through a lot of nonsense on business news and figure out what's real and what's not. And so if you want to learn to do those things, that's a specialty, and it's hoping that something I can share with the folks here at LaSalle more going forward. But that's why I do the work on the 14th Amendment and why this notion of due process and equality are so important. And so thank you for taking the time to sit and talk. And please hang out. Questions, reception, I don't know. Do we want to do a big group question thing, or? I think if, if, we, if it looks like people are for it, we have time for some, a few questions, and then people can make If folks have to go, let's let folks go, and then we can have more conversation. I know there's other things on people's schedule. Drinks and snacks. Obviously, I should not be off camera. Are there any questions for Dr. Air? Yes, ma'am. Hello. <laughs> last year, last year, that's all. I know how curriculum is formed, and yes, yeah, the barriers. Yeah, doesn't even have their phone. Yep, no, I know, they and just they actually had that ruling. Yes. Yeah, right so you're I just kidding. Like, <laughs> no, I, I was probably speaking nationally, yeah. is, is what I'm looking at, is that we claim to be the society that's about kind of competition and player play and how people find opportunity. And the schools are the absolute best place to teach so much of this. But I remember having to fight in Jersey for a decade just to get basic financial literacy that people could learn how to actually use banking. Right. Right. And so, yes, I'm not surprised, but like as I came to this, I would say when I started this, I was like, why am I doing this uh, 21 years into my formal education? Like, why did I have to study real estate markets to figure out how money worked? Right. Like, that should just be, Money is so important here. We can't just let people think, oh, as long as I deposit some money, I can go use my ATM and spend more money. Right. It's the most idiotic thing we would ever communicate to people, but that's what we get bombarded with with advertising every day. Yep. Here's more ways to spend your money, and your skin itch is we'll take all your money. Like, just... Well, I mean, I think, I think if the board versus Brown, we lost our educational capital, capital as the board, then it's going to be So I, was, I was talking about last night, the way that we chose to desegregate was extraordinarily damaging to everybody. So, I mean, like, the statistics where you have, like, I think it's like 87% of teachers are white and then we don't get to see ourselves in, in the classroom. Of course, I work on education. Yeah. But I did retail, so I looked at both, like, mm -hmm. people buy more, buy more, yeah. buy more. Oh, it's a joy to have you here. Thank you for the question. Yes.
So I published a bunch of essays that are free online called The Engine of Creation. Uh, if you just put that phrase in, Engine of Creation, Walter Grayson, you can just download the PDF. There's a whole section on the economics that I didn't get into here today about how do we actually communicate at the household and neighborhood level to actually conserve the resources that we really give our lives away to get a hold of. Um, one of the fundamental things, uh, I'm trying to think, I don't think it was in yesterday's talk. Um, I grew up with the idea that you get a full-time job and that's what you have for your budget to figure out you know, how much you have to spend and how much you can save and how much you can put away for a rainy day or for retirement. What was amazing for me was learning around 2001, oh, you can have more than one stream of income? And I was like, okay, what is that? How does that work? And so a big part of what I do in community centers now is teach everyone who comes out, doesn't matter how old, how to have at least three streams of income, one active and two passive. And so passive streams of income are essentially uh, investments, but you can also do it with real estate. Um, and you just initially are targeting getting an extra maybe $100 a week, $200 a month. But that extra money goes a ridiculously long way. And so as I thought about it, I thought back to older relatives that I had, that they just did that out of necessity. Like there wasn't a one full-time position, salary job that they could make ends meet with. They had to have three, four, five, six different ways that they could find money on any given day to do something just to kind of keep food on the table. And I was like, there is such abundant resources now, especially in the Northeastern United States, that when you teach people how to take advantage of that, I had a student who coped with multiple disabilities and graduated from college but couldn't get a job, not a full-time job. And so we worked for about three years and so he balanced out, you know, managing two or three part-time jobs at a time. And then because he had those layers of income, we actually found other ways to reduce his expenses, but then he started to invest and he, what, is like 36, 37 now, and he doesn't need a full-time job. His savings and investments carry him. And so in basically 15, 16 years, his whole life changed from essentially being on the brink of homelessness and, and really not being able to sustain himself to actually being stable and able to kind of control whatever circumstance he wants to get into on a given day. So um, Engine of Creation walks through ways that you do that, and there's just amazing stuff that happens. I, living in Minneapolis, I didn't realize they have co-ops everywhere. So when you're living in a building, like you're not paying your own energy bill. Everybody does an energy bill for the building, and then everybody shares it equally. I was living in a townhouse last year. My energy bill was 300 bucks a month. Now it's like 120. And like in Philadelphia, you don't see a whole lot of co-op development. There's a few here and there, but it would change the quality of life for thousands of people. So co-ops work really well. Food co-ops are spectacular and much healthier than going to most of the grocery stores we go to. Um, I know I'm missing something. Well, there's housing co-ops too. Where you can basically abolish homelessness. Like homelessness is really a choice policy choice where you can build different ways for people to live and actually make it virtually cost-free for both municipal government and for the individuals. So, um, you know, I think a lot about uh, Franklin Roosevelt's Economic Bill of Rights he adopts after the Second New Deal. And it's where you get the initial proposal for a national health care system, that how do you control a cost that, you know, everybody is eventually going to need to participate in. Um, those kinds of interventions, we've convinced ourselves for like 40 years that, oh, we can't afford them, it's too burdensome, in favor of creating ridiculously wealthy people around the world. And it's just like, yeah, we accept that some people just have to suffer, you know, it's kind of a tragedy. Yeah. Um, I want to follow up on this question because um, I understand what you're saying about the concept of financial literacy, and it's important, but I'm going to push on yeah, this too. No, 
there's, there's I, different ways that that term means different things. So, because yeah. I think it's good for people here to have this discussion. Do you feel though it's also weaponized yes. the idea of financial literacy, right? You you're buying too much avocado toast, stop buying <laughs> your cup of coffee, right? Oh. It, it, right, so that's your financial illiteracy that has you <laughs> in your financial struggle, right? As opposed to what, a lot of what you were talking about in your talk, right? The systemic issues, it's, it's smoke and mirrors to then not address this, the systems, right? That keep people um, from being able to have just a basic level of dignity to live in, basic shelter, food, and things like that. And uh, as you were giving the example about the disabled person, um, like that's a great example, right? Why didn't that person have jobs? Ableism, right? <laughs> There's a whole thing of like how much harder it is for people with disabilities to get jobs, even when they're, you, you know, people highly qualified. highly qualified still often get bypassed. And then there's also laws that put disabled people in financial disadvantage. For example, a lot of people who are disabled can't get married because they will lose their disability money, yeah. right? So literally you have to stay single to get the small amount of pay that you uh, get, um, I'm blanking on the term, but you know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? The disability um, money. And so if you go a little bit over, then you no longer eligible for these things. So these kind of things perpetuate the cycle. So I just kind of want to have a dialogue no, about that, is, right? The yeah. Financial literacy versus all these things that often get, like you were talking about the pundits, right? Oh, stop buying this thing and getting on TV. But so they're talking about this published. part of it, right? There's just an article published about this that said, oh, if you're too poor, we'll stop eating breakfast. Yes. <laughs> And it was like, stop it. Like, it's just a basic need. And so to go a little bit deeper into that, we punish poverty. We want to punish poverty. It's almost like if you're poor, you need to be treated as, you know, morally worthless or certainly next to incarcerated. You know, your human rights are at risk. And I talk about the property rights dictate our life and liberty. Like somebody who does not have social standing a home you know, a job, like, they're at moral risk. They can be beaten and killed by any number of people that they can encounter in a day. And I get into this discussion a lot with uh, William Darity, who is an amazing economist uh, down at Duke. And Darity is a huge champion for reparations, and he and I have a book coming out together. But, like, the way that he frames it, I disagree with some of his assumptions. And so we really fight over racial wealth gap stuff. And what are the ways, and he always comes after me about the multiple incomes and the way that investment works. It's like, that'll never close the racial wealth gap. True, it will not. But it will guarantee economic stability. And that's a different standard. Like, I'd much rather try and close the racial wealth gap with a population that's essentially abolished poverty, rather than let poverty continue to thrive and then be like, well, look how bad the gap is. Like, it's like, let's accept people's material deprivation so that we can make a better political point. And I'm like, yeah, no, I can't, I can't sign on that. And so there are strategies designed to just make sure we don't have people suffer anymore. And then there are strategies that structurally lead to actually everybody being able to achieve their full potential or as close to it as they can. And to me, being very clear about which things do what is, is essential if you're going to actually move the political discussion. And the other quick point I want to make ties to this when you were talking about your your injury and hoping that you know 10, 20 years you're not <laughs> considered useless. useless that there are Yale and MIT <laughs> economists literally right now making those arguments. Mm -hmm. One came out with an article, I don't want to live uh, after 75 or something like that, literally talking about people over 70 being a drain. Another one was arguing for uh, content warning about suicide, but uh, the, you know who I'm talking yeah. about in, at Yale, arguing that one of the solutions for Japan's elderly is mass suicide. So yeah. these arguments are being made currently, and uh, it's all tied to this. Yes, indeed. I just want to know, um, what do you think will happen with Social Security and Medicare? 
I don't think they're willing to pay the, the cost to really go after it in this term of Congress. The real worry is beyond the 2024 election. And so if there's sufficient voter suppression to change to an entirely wholly Republican government, you see what I'm saying, you know, um, then yeah, you do need to worry. They're, they're gonna do something to either, at the minimum, raise the age of eligibility. Like that is almost automatic. But it's all about kind of the balance of who controls the Senate, who controls the House, who's in the presidency. And I think we don't talk enough about the, the shift for the Supreme Court. Like the rest of my life is largely dedicated to renegotiating this um, 2016 where uh, Scalia passes away and um, Mitch McConnell prevents Obama from appointing Merrick Garland, um, then followed by the Trump election and, and the appointee that he chose. Um, you're going to have a society that actually pushes towards more kind of draconian, less social welfare in the United States for another 20 years, maybe another 40. And so how do we actually use state government to kind of counterbalance that? Um, it's, it's a very difficult moment to then forecast out how these things are gonna go. But yeah, I, I don't worry about the short term and, and someone you know who is 55 or older right now probably going to be okay, but over the time, you know, Juliana, I don't know, Social Security might not be there for you. She's like, it's cool, I got my people. <laughs> right, you going to rely on me in the whole <laughs> Teamwork, teamwork, stay together, families. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So I think you started to talk about my question a little bit in your um, description of the debate you have with strategies close the racial wealth gap. And so I'm wondering, is it fair or accurate to describe your advice as saying, here's how to win at a system that is inherently inequitable versus strategizing about how to create a system that is inherently more equitable? Yeah, and that is like, who is this student? He's got, he's got Rope's Baby Bond's proposal. Um, oh gosh, I can see his face, up at the new school. Dad. Derek Hamilton. Um, Derek is always screaming at me, one form or another. He's like, you're not doing enough, push harder, you're gonna get more. I'm like, I believe in going for that, but I also am very pragmatic about what we can do right now. And so, I wouldn't even say win, but just how do you survive and avoid the worst consequences on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis? That's really my immediate goal, because I just know too many people. My, my first real program I ever built was a food pro program where every month on the first of the month, everybody would pitch in like $10. And then two weeks later, we'd build and bring them a basket full of food to make sure they had enough food to get through the end of the month. Like that told me everything I needed to know about it doesn't take a whole lot of money, just a little bit directed well, and you can guarantee a good outcome for a lot of people. And so that's the organizing principle I'm always working with, that there are crises right now that require just a little bit of help and we make it better. And then if we put more pe people in a position to support structural change, that is much more likely to happen too. Well, I think I have run <laughs> this full course, but thank you all so much for the invitation to be a part of the conversation. And I think there are still snacks back there, so, so some good things available. <laughs>